The first question everyone wants to know is why. Uh, I think it's something I really needed to do for myself. And uh, I just hear my music my way. It was something that I've been wanting to do for, for years. Basically, that's, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. What's the difference between going in and doing your record and going in and doing a Foreigner album? Um, I think basically being behind the wheel, so to speak. Steering it the way you want to go from um, song content through arrangement, through production, you know, right, right to the very end, the mastering. And knowing that right or wrong, this is the way that you see it. And uh, commercialism aside, that a good song will stand up and be, you know, infectious and endear itself to the public, despite flaws and uh, hopefully inclusive of spontaneity and uh, recklessness. You know, there are the elements that uh, don't hinder rock and roll. They, they're the very core of rock and roll. And that's, that's what I tried to put into my album. So that's more of a, a different philosophy you have, uh, whereas a foreigner might polish and polish and polish. You say, hey, this is just rock and roll is what it is. That's right. Yeah. Has this record already created more of a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction for you, even though it hasn't you know, gotten its barometer from the public yet? Yeah, I, I really needed to, to feel that I was able to do this because uh, years ago when I first started writing, it was kind of practice for what I'm doing now. Uh, but most of the things I, I participated in Foreigner always kind of had to have a mix stamp of approval on it. And uh, I was never quite able to see it through to the end my way because, you know, Foreigner is, is mixed baby, so to speak. And um, it feels good to, to do it uninhibited. Yeah. Now, you were originally a drummer. How do you write songs? I mean, you don't hit the snare drum and say, I want A with that. <laughs> uh, usually the, the, uh, the beat... And the, the phrasing come first. It could be the way a, a rap record would first attract attention. It's, it's, it would be the beat and, and the phrasing, no matter what the words are, the phrasing against the beat. And, and when that kicks in, then, uh, then the melody would be next. And I think the words would finally end up being, the hook would end up being last. Yeah. But, um, Is that how these songs on these records started with you on yeah, drums? It was, it was the, yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Was the songwriting process very different? I mean, after all, you've written so many big hits with, like, Mick, mainly, and now you're ro writing with somebody else, Bruce. Yeah. Well, Bruce and I go back about 10, 15 years um, to, to Black Sheep, and uh, we kind of had a loose songwriting arrangement. It wasn't necessarily uh, his music, my my words, anything like that. It, it, could, it could be anything, and um, that's we kind of picked up where we left off. And uh, there's some musical ideas that are his. Uh, there's a few more that are mine. Uh, we we swapped words like it was nothing. You know, it was uh, it was uh, egos were non-existent. Uh, it was the good of the song and uh, the impact that 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 kind of made the difference. And we know we know when it felt right. I think for us, like to get a complete story on Ready or Not, we should go back to your early days. Okay. <laughs> Because uh, this album, in, in a, many ways, is a family affair, too. So why don't you fill us in a little bit about your family, where they're from, and what they've been doing for a living. We're from uh, Rochester, New York. And that's uh, upstate western New York. That's, that's Kodak country, mm -hmm. Xerox, yeah. you know. And my parents were big band people in the 40s. My dad had a 16-piece big band. And uh, that's how he met my mom. My mom was the singer. In the band? In the band. So they were big into to jazz. And uh, later on, my dad had a, a bop trio in the uh, early 50s. So he started swinging? Yeah, he started swinging a little bit. And uh, kind of shut down the works about the time Elvis came out. <laughs> oh, yeah? I still remember my brothers and I sitting in the back seat of a uh, 53 Pontiac, and my dad... Uh, trying to scan the uh, the AM stations in vain because if it wasn't a uh, hound dog, it was uh, a won't you be my daddy? And uh, you know, Everly Brothers, all the good things like that. My my brothers and I really going wild in the back seat, and he just kept on turning that station looking for the Dorsey Brothers and uh, Woody Herman and 
and I, I knew something was happening here. You know? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned your brothers as well, because um, they're on the record. That's right. Why don't you explain uh, the musicality of your brothers? Um, <clears throat> you have two brothers. Two let's brothers. Say. I have an older brother, Ben, who played drums on the album, and my younger brother, Richard, who uh, played some guitar on the album. We were always kind of competitive as, as kids in, in just about everything we did. Ben played trumpet like Ben Sr., my dad, and uh, Richard played guitar, and I was the drummer. And uh, my first set was a 1930 set of Gretsch, 28-inch yeah. bass drum, blue and gold lacquer, Ooh. <laughs> calf skins heads, and cat gut ribs. Well, you were it, huh? Yeah, we were happening. It. And uh, <laughs> Ben used to sneak down and practice my drums when I wasn't home, and inside of about six to eight months, he completely blew by me as a drummer. He just had a natural natural thing about drums. You know, at that point, I, I knew someday you know, I was going to have to put down those sticks because I couldn't stand to be number two in the family. <laughs> so uh, we actually played in rival bands for, for the longest time. Uh, Dick was a member of Black Sheep for a few years, actually at the very beginning of Black Sheep. And uh, he, he eventually went on to play with Ben in one of Ben's bands, but the three brothers never played in the same band. Just It just didn't happen. Ben went to school in Boston for music, and, uh, you know, I got a call from Mick Jones, and it just, uh, we all went our different ways. So this is kind of the uh, the culmination, kind of finishing unfinished business. Yeah, it's kind of a complete circle in many ways, this record. I want to go a little bit back again. We, we started to get ahead of ourselves. Okay. Went to when you actually got that first set of drums. How old were you? Uh, I was about nine years old. Nine years old. And uh, Ben... Well, I guess would come in and steal your drums for a while, huh? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be out playing football or something with the guys, and I'd, I'd hear this, you know, I'd be down the street, and I'd hear this faint thunder and tapping and stuff, you know. And then I'd come home, and my seat would be adjusted, and the snare would be different, and the cymbals would be different, you know, and he'd just have this smirk on his face. You know? <laughs> that gets you pissed. At you. Yeah, it got me pissed. <laughs> That's my seat. Your mother, you also mentioned since she was singing. Is that where you think you got your voice from? I don't know. Uh, after hearing her scream at me throughout my childhood, I know that I got the range from her. Now, you got your, the first drum set around nine, but you didn't get into your first band until you were about 16. That's right. All right. What took so long? Um, basically, we, we moved when I was about 11 or 12 years old, and it was just um, it was difficult. Uh, a lot of the, the young bands, when the Beatles and stuff first came out, the, the kids in the neighborhood, they had their bands formed, and it was mostly based on friendship, certainly not musical ability. So even though I... I was a better drummer than a lot of those kids, you know. I just I couldn't crack into their uh, their circle of friends, so I just kept practicing. That's all. And mm -hmm. um, another thing was I I was a concert drummer. I, I you know orchestra stuff, and I was I played timpani and and the whole gamut of percussion. And uh, it wasn't first and foremost in my mind to get into a band at that point. Yeah. So a lot of those seven years in between the time that you uh, got the drum set and you were maybe your dad you played with sometimes. Yeah, he used to come down with his horn and we used to do some play. Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> no, we used to do I Got You Under My Skin and uh, Perdido and a lot of those. You know. Yeah, I see. So tell me a little bit about your first band. Do you remember the name? Yeah, it was called. <laughs> that's spelled P H F F T. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. Is this the band that I read about? They were kind of heavy bunch of guys. Yeah, at that time I was oh I was fifteen, almost sixteen years old, and they were in their mid twenties. Their heroes were obviously Elvis and Gene Vincent and uh, the Kingsmen, and uh, we played all songs like that. I think we played one or two Beatles songs, maybe a Stone song, but it was really uh, you know uh, leather jacket, collar up, hair slicked back. That was the image. That was the way the band was. <laughs> Did you call them greasers? Yeah, greasers. Hoods, we call them. Hoods. You, you either hood, a hood, or a college. All right, so you're in with a bunch of greasers here, Lou. Yeah. They get you into cars? Is that how you first got into cars? Yeah, definitely. The uh, the bass player used to have to pick me up from my house because I was you know, too young to drive, and he had a 65 GTO. That was it. I was I was cooked. Yeah, love that car. After jobs and stuff, we used to uh, run Lake Avenue, and that's, that's where I first... I caught the bug. Now, also, with is this the first moment that you got a chance to get out in front in front of the band at all? I mean, from what I I know, I think you, there was one song during the set. Is this true or no? Uh, 
I don't remember. There not, being with one. <laughs> not with... I think that came a few years later when it was basically the same members, but we changed the name, obviously. We, we were going no place with that name. So. <laughs> I don't know why. It's kind of catchy. It looked good in print, Dan, but it just... You, Hard to you say. couldn't shout out, we want... F yeah. yeah. <laughs> we weren't stirring it up. Yeah? So we changed it to St. James Infirmary. The infirmary, we just call it. Uh -huh. and, uh, I did get a chance to sing a... Um, I forgot what it was. I think it could have been a Dusty Springfield song or something. Some, some ballad, I forgot. Okay. The uh, real quick success of the first Foreigner album, after, you know, your struggles for many years, that turned your head at all? It was exciting, yeah. I don't think my values changed. I still longed for, for Rochester and home and secretly wished, you know, that it could have been Black Sheep with his success and not Foreigner. Nothing it, against the music or the, or the guys. It was the way my dream should have ended. Writing with Mick for that first album, did that just go very smoothly? It, all it went really it? fast. Actually, him and Ian McDonald were supposed to be the, the main writers, and I kind of was hesitant to contribute. I kept waiting for them to, to blow me away with, with their collaborations, and it, it really never happened. So it was almost out of necessity that, that Mick and I started to get together, and uh, we just rattled off a bunch of them right away. And they it were feels good. Like the first time, and uh, he uh, that was based, that was mixed. That was written before I was in the band, but uh -huh. long, long way from home. Uh, Cold as ice. A lot of a lot of the early ones. Yeah, yeah. You co-wrote a lot of hits for Foreigner with Mick over the past ten years. Now, I guess when the songs came out, you expressed already earlier that there was a lot of, you know, I guess f fighting as to how exactly a song would sound when it finally came out, right? Yeah, it was it was more that he had he had a sound in mind for Foreigner and and. He had a vision of the way he wanted the, the final result of the song to sound. For the most part, I, you know, I went along with him, except when the song ideas were, were my ideas and I had something slightly different in mind, at a certain point it wouldn't be up to me anymore. And I, I honestly didn't think that was fair. And um, it wasn't that I was going to take it some radical direction that wouldn't be foreigner. I just, I heard it slightly different. and. Uh, and it seemed to me that just because it was different, it wasn't necessarily, you know, not right. Yeah, and um, it just used to eat away at me that I that I couldn't, I I would never know if if my direction was as uh, palatable and enjoyable and and maybe even better than than where he heard it. And those were those were like unanswered questions. It's like uh, somebody, you know, painting a picture and and somebody finishing it for you when when you think it's finished already or writing something, a good uh, piece of literature, and somebody correcting your spelling, when it, ultimately that kind of doesn't make a difference. Right. You know? I learned a lot from Mick, but at some point he couldn't teach me anything anymore, and I saw myself on equal footing with him, eye to eye, and he, he would just never, he could never look at it that way. Wow. So, well, let's get to the point now where you have your say. Let's get to the new record. Yeah. So, uh, how did you treat your voice differently, say, in the, with this record? Not a lot differently. I, I, I don't think I, I, I pushed myself to the point of being torn up, you know, which for the last couple of Foreigner records, uh, you know, especially four. Yeah. Um, it was for effect, I think, on those records. I think it sounds great, but I, I don't particularly like to, to sing in that um, half scream all the time. I'm, I'm capable of other things. I think it's it's good texture, but I don't want I you know I don't like it to be overused. I remember talking to you back around four, and you were going through hell at that time. Yeah, I was. I think it a lot more spontaneity came forth this time. Um, I didn't work out the melodies and the the scats and this and that to a point where um, they felt unnatural to me. You know, sometimes they're there on this album. Sometimes it's it's pretty stark. I went with the way. It feels at the time, and when it was done, it was done. So you left what maybe some people would refer to as maybe rough edges. Yeah, I mean, I could have spent a lot more time rethinking it, and maybe it could have been better. You know, I'm sure there's some people who think it, it, you know, it could have been better. Uh, there could be more, could be more on it. It could have been um, higher gloss. It could have been a lot of things. It's, but it's, it's my first effort. There's uh, sincerity there. There's conviction there. There's rough edges there. And uh, it's it's the sound I want to start with. This is not the first and only one. This is the place I want to start. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, the definition of rock and roll right there you just gave us, which is pretty good. What made you think of using Nils Lofgren for guitar work on this record? He was a uh, guitar hero from 
from the Black Sheep days when he was in Grin, You're the Weight, and things like that, and Cry Tough. and uh, White Lies back then? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And we had tried some other people, and um, we had s- some other guitar players play, and it was, it was real good, their contributions. But um, there was a certain fire. There was some songs that really needed a guitar sound and a, a, a guitar style that was identifiable and really biting. I thought of Nils, and it was like, no, nah, look what he's doing now, man. He, it's, it's like, come on, you, how can you reach this guy, you know? And uh, we just tried. And uh, I mean, from the time I thought of using Nils, I would swear within 15 minutes I was on the phone talking to him. Really? Cut, you know, no, no management, no have your answering service call mine. It was, it was just, you know, it was me and Nils on the phone, and he was like, yeah, great, let's do it. Really? That's great. I must have made, got you up again oh, about the record. Man. It, was, it was terrific. Yeah. He came down uh, he, uh, to do one or two songs and ended up playing on six. So <laughs> we, I think we hit it off. Yeah, he was pretty enthused about the material, huh? Yeah, he was. He did some great playing on this record, which I think we're going to get to. How'd you locate Bruce again after? I mean, had you always stayed in touch with him? or Always stayed in touch. Um, Christmas, uh, I'd see him in Rochester, and we'd, we'd jam and, and talk about old times and and you know I, I helped him on he he was he was after a record deal and did demos and stuff and i i helped him on his stuff and every time i was on the west coast i'd run into him with foreigner you know we'd hang out he was hanging out in la in la for a while sacramento and uh you know we always kept on saying someday someday we'll we'll do this someday we'll do that and uh i mean the years went by and we just kept on saying someday when I finally was able to do my project, I mean, he was he was the first person I called, and I said, hey, pal, it's it's someday is now, you know, let's go. That's great. I always thought Forner did the best work when you guys kind of had your back up against a wall or when you had something to prove. Like, I know the first album mm-hmm. and the four album, because yeah. members changed. Um, do you think that's kind of the position you were in when you started work on this record? I think I had to prove, to, you know, that I was I was capable of doing this type of thing to myself wasn't looked upon in the kindest of lights by um, you know, uh, others in the band and the organization. But um, I needed it for my self-esteem. I need for people to see me in this light so they can judge on their own terms my contributions to Foreigner, in a way. I think that's important. I didn't do it as a vendetta. I think I needed this to turn the last page of Black Sheep, actually, and g- yeah. get that over. That's interesting. I got a feeling... Um some of these songs have been around a while. Is that true? Yeah, a few of them have. They've been around. Some of, about three of them have been around for about five or six years. Yeah. Some are a couple years old. Some of them are brand new. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a few that were presented to Foreigner and and uh, kind of brushed aside. I want to go through some of the songs in the record now with you. Um, talk about it. Ready or not? Is that kind of the way you feel about the record? Yeah, that was the first thing Bruce and I worked on for this record could have been overdue or, or long ready t- too long ready you know <laughs> but uh, i suppose that would say it yeah yeah the guitar in this the rhythm guitar is kind of like a power station feel to it you know do you understand what i mean yeah, yeah. it's uh bruce is is a bass player but you know plays pretty radical uh, rhythm guitar uh most of the time out of tune, but we managed to keep him in tune. And he's 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 a real aggressive player. And uh, most of the he did most of the rhythm work on this album. And, yeah, uh, it's better than I I thought it would be. Oh, it's real good. And I I would definitely call this aggressive rhythm on this song. Yes. And Nils doing the lead there. That's Nils' lead. Yeah. You can tell it's kind of like he's got this. I don't know. I don't want to want to call it chicken scratch sound. You know the way. <laughs> How would you describe his guitar? It's pretty searing. I mean, he's his harmonics have harmonics. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. His harmonics have harmonics. I get to the song Midnight Blue, which is the first single from the record. Mm-hmm. Tremendous song. Thank you. Wasn't that around for a while? That's been around for about a year and a half, two years, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did your dad really say that to you? Uh, not in those words, but, but pretty much, you know. Uh, when I was uh, torn between music and uh, and college and college and and, uh, and uh, age to be married almost you know and I was balancing hanging in the balance on whether to uh, to see this music thing through or or just bow out of it like I was seeing a lot of kids my age do when they when they reach a certain age and they they want to settle down you know and uh, he was kind of telling me from his own experience if you're going to do this you know you better keep freewheeling and and don't tie yourself down. 
in many ways he sort of said like uh, it's either this or that right? that's right it's either cherry red or midnight blue yeah <laughs> <laughs> the song has this great, like, I don't know, kind of like this breathy urgency, you know? And the rhythm track, did you work on that? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Just playing with the drum machine? It was a drum machine at first, yeah. Actually, it was me on, on drums. It was, it's pretty simple rhythm. Then when I put it in song form, we went to a drum machine. Just because my meter was so bad, the song started at one tempo and ended up really fast. <laughs> and then uh, I finally got Ben down to, to put it right for me. Calling the brother. <laughs> Call him in, you know. That was, it was fine. Like, yeah, you win, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. If I don't have you, it's very moody, atmospheric. Uh, great yeah. day. That was around for about three or four years. That I was playing to anybody who would listen on the on the uh, on the Foreigner tour, last Foreigner tour. Yeah. I think those guys have heard that song more than enough already. <laughs> I might be hearing it some more. That's right. <laughs> she got to know. I'd kind of describe as a. Hard rock soul song. Yeah, it's kind of like a kickback to the old Stax days. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there's a phrase in there where it kind of reminds me of Otis Redding, uh, Try a Little Tenderness. That's, that's who I want to hear that song, I'll tell you. Yeah? <laughs> Otis, I hope you're listening. Oh, man. That, that's really good. In the horn section? That's uh, my dad, uh, my brother Ben, uh, Mark Rivera, and uh, another horn player. Yeah. It sounds great, though, that song. I like that. It's one of my favorites. Thanks. Arrow Through Your Heart. This is really biting Nils' guitar work here. Definitely. Yeah. It's uh, hypnotic stuff. It yeah. sounds, uh, it has a slightly Eastern flavor to his guitar work. You know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's borderline metal. You know, it's, it's a little R&B with armor. In Chain of Love, your brother Ben is really kicking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a Motown flavor to it. That I, I think it's, it reminds me of the tops a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because it really gets that drive and beat. Mm-hmm. And uh, Love Her Come Back is a beautiful, beautiful song. That's a strange one. That almost didn't make the album because we, d we didn't know quite what treatment to give it. Uh, we tried real drums. It, it, didn't, it didn't suit it. It's all it's programmed stuff, and it's pretty airy, that whole thing. How does that end the record, Love Her Come Back? Uh, it kind of leaves it open, like a um, to-be-continued kind of vibe. That's a good way of saying that. I like that. Okay. Now that you did a, fo uh, a solo record, does this mean Foreigners breaking up? I think if I don't call Mick in about 10 minutes, uh, yeah, could be. <laughs> no, but uh, for seriousness, so people can actually hear you say. Uh, a lot of people were concerned about that, within and without the group. Actually, Mick and I are um, writing together right now and uh, in hopes of uh, Foreigner going in the studio sometime in early March for a uh, late summer, early fall release. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, perhaps the fact that you actually did a record on your own now might actually help the internal situation within the band? It's going to help me. It's going to help my attitude towards working within the band because I, I won't try and be as pushy for my own um, ideas and my own point of view. I'll be able to express myself on my solo albums and um, help Mick with Foreigner as he wanted it all along. So, I'll, you know, I'll help him get the best out of all of us and uh, let Foreigner be Foreigner and Lou Graham be Lou Graham. That's great. Actually very healthy. You know. So you kind of ran through the current plans. You going to do any gigs with this material? Uh, I would love to. I don't know what the schedule is as far as um, Foreigner recording and this and that, but I think if, if any of these songs take off, I want to put it together and, and go out for, for a dozen shows just to uh, see what it sounds like live and um, do it again and have some fun yeah have some fun who do you think the band would be if uh, you did get a chance to go out and do it uh, pretty much the people who played on the record um, they're all around and available I think I think I'm sure even Nils would would like to come out and uh, I'll, you know I'll bring pop out yeah for the horn section sure that's cool so are, are your parents into rock and roll now oh yeah definitely they know a lot about what's going on yeah. now when they hear their son on the radio they don't try to turn it down no, I, I, they might. They turned it down, I think, as long as it's not off.